How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Um, it's after two o'clock, so I'm sure you guys are getting nice and sleepy. So I'm hoping that I can keep you up and excited for the rest of this talk. Um, but before we begin, I have some housekeeping to cover um, and we'll get right into it. Uh, similar to the game, uh, this talk also has a mental health advisory. Um, we will be t covering serious topics of addiction, PTSD, panic attacks, anxiety, and delusions. Um, people may experience fear of dentistry, tight spaces, or vomit. And we approach these topics with lightheaded manner and it's maybe distressing, but we always try to approach these topics with empathy. So let's begin. So welcome to the talk of the art direction of Psychonauts 2. Um, today we'll start with some intros, I'll tell you who I am, and some ground rules, and then we'll begin our psychedelic journey. This is not a technical talk. Um, it's about the creative journey that our team and I went on in order to create the game that you have gotten to enjoy. And uh, this is also uh, a dedication to the work the team and I did. So feel free to ask questions at the end and we'll get into a little bit, a bit of that later. So I'll introduce myself really quickly. Uh, my name is Lisette Didrie Montgomery. I have been an art director in the game industry for well, I've been doing this for 21 years. I've been in leadership for over 10. Um, I've worked at studios large and small, large studios like EA and Ubisoft, um, and then small studios like Backbone and now Double Fine. I've worked on 14 different engines across multiple genres. Here's some of the ship titles that I made. Um, Psychonauts 2 is also, my, of course, my why you're all here. But I've been making games for quite some time. In addition to making games for the last 20 years, I've also been an instructor at GameHead. So I see a few of my students here, thank you. Um, and uh, so I'm very experienced at being in the classroom. And so I have a few rules. Uh, first rule is no cell phones or phone discussions during the talk. I will have the talking turtle until QA. Please hold questions until the end. Um, and there will be maybe a pop quiz. <laughs> And the third and most important rule is that we're all here to learn and to have fun. So I will start with one of the most common questions that we got during development. Why are you taking so long? <laughs> <laughs> so why did Psychonauts 2 take so long? Well, there's a list of reasons and it kind of reads like a Christmas song. 16 years after the first game, 13 unique brain levels that all needed their own art direction, 10 years of planning, seven years of development, five and a half hours of cutscenes, three missed deadlines, two publishers, and a big campaign. So <laughs> the real reason why, however, is that our initial production processes and our art direction processes did not work for the game we were actually making. So just a quick recap of where I, the game was when I started. Um, the FIG campaign happened in 2015 and production, pre-production start, started shortly after. And I joined Double Fine in August of 2017. So that meant that the game didn't really have a dedicated art director for the first two years. The team had also just completed their first vertical slice or playable level. And everyone felt like it was close, but it wasn't quite as psychonautical as we wanted it to be. And I'll explain the term psychonautical. Um, it's a term that we use on the team to describe if, whether the game itself was close and felt true to the first game and what we were trying to do in this game. So if something didn't feel quite right, we would say it's not psychonautical. Or if something was really cool and trippy, we would say that. So one of the biggest challenges I noticed at the time was that the leadership um, who was in place created a big studio structure. Um, the lead designer had come from uh, a really large studio and he was used to the siloed departments and sort of how content moved through those departments in that way. Which is great for a large studio and that sort of structure uh, works when you're having teams of three or 400 people, but not necessarily so well when you're dealing with a team of maybe 30 or 40 artists and 20 designers. So there's just not, there just isn't the kind of structure that works with a small team. 
So this is an example of uh, what the structure was like when I began. Um, essentially, everyone is reporting to the lead designers. Below that are directors like myself, where we are approving features and working with the lead designer on how things work. Below that are the art leads, so they are the technical and craftsmanship mentors that work with our uh, implementers. And the people who actually do the work are all the way at the bottom. So you can see that everyone at the bottom is just reacting to decisions, but they're not necessarily participating in it. And then decisions all had to be funded through the LD. So that was just creating a lot of confusion and tension. Once again, this process works great when you're at a big studio. It doesn't work so great when you're at a small studio. And this is an example of what the vertical slice looked like when I began. And it's a really great start. When you look at it, it feels close to being psychonautical, but there's also a lot of visual challenges. First thing is that the team is having a really hard time figuring out how to make it easy for the player to understand where to go and how to navigate. Um, landmarks were hard to distinguish. Um, the shape language wasn't as clear. And I think the worst culprit was the back wall. If you literally notice the back wall, and there's a static shot of that. There's a lot of repeating, repetitive shapes, and that was just creating a wall of noise, and it was making it hard for the player to know what was important. Um, and the culprit, and the main culprit for this, was our level design process. As I mentioned before, we had big studio processes, so every you know content would go through design and white box, then it would go to art to update, then it would go through the pipeline to VFX and foliage. So that wasn't really necessarily working extremely well. And you kind of see that here. The kit process we were using in order to save on costs, which is essentially reusing a lot of assets because we had such a small team, was also leading to this visual noise and lack of identif identifiable landmarks. In addition to that, we just needed a new work a way to work together. Um, a lot of the team was just frustrated. The silos departments were not communicating well. Um, people were not quite sure why decisions were made and where they were coming from, and that's because they were all being funneled up through the top. So over Christmas break, I kind of really quickly realized we needed a new way to restructure the team if this was going to work and we were going to be able to ship Psychonauts too. And I really focused on the feedback that I got from the team over the months after I started and what they were mostly frustrated about. And what they were mostly frustrated about was a lack of ownership. They felt like they were just reacting to things coming from departments, but they had no say in the work that they actually had to do. So I rallied a team, a small team of leads to sequester a small team to try out a new process. And this is a reflection of that process. So what you're seeing is a core team that's driving ideas, and these are the people who actually do the work here in the center. And then you have directors over uh, to the right, lower left providing support, and also support team members who are our technical experts who are additionally providing support. So everybody's there to support the strike team and not vice versa. The next thing I did to kind of get the team to work better together is start having more forms of structured meetings in play. Um, I won't get into the rules of IDEO brainstorming, but this is an excellent framework for putting a team together in order to um, quickly ideate on ideas. And I won't get into all of the rules, but the most important thing is the yes and. When you're in the middle of a brainstorm, the yes and rule is probably the most important. Um, it also stops the negative Nancys from dominating the conversation, and it focuses the team on the best ideas and having them expand on them together. I also learned a lot of other um, design thinking methodologies that I use in my team, and I'll cover some of those later. But a lot of that I learned from leading for creativity, a course at IDEO. And with all of the leadership challenges we have, I think any resources we can find are great to share. So what you're now looking at is the final result of changing that process. This is what the quarry looks like in the shipping game. And this wouldn't have been possible without restructuring the team. And trust me, this is the last of the processy stuff. Um, but what you played in the game today would not be possible without this change. And I think it's important for people who are art directors and leaders to understand you have to structure your team around how your team works and the culture of your studio, and not necessarily what may have worked at a larger studio or what worked at what you did before. So and what's also extremely the most important is transferring ownership to your implementers 
and also making sure that you're there for them and providing proper support. Um, and it's also, and the most vital, is trying to change your team culture so that the people with the best ideas um, aren't coming from the loudest people in the room. And I think that was one of the challenges that we were also having. So with this new process and a new way to work and some you know, proven results, we needed to start on rebooting the rest of the game. And we started with Lobato's Labyrinth. So we knew we were probably getting closer to being able to make the game we want, but we needed to actually finish an entire level. And we also knew that E3 2019 was coming up fast and marketing and our partners wanted to have a playable demo on site. So we had less than three months to make a demo. We had a new process that we just kind of started figuring out and we needed to figure out how we were gonna to get to E3 while we were running out of time. So I'll do a quick uh, update of what Le Bottle's level is like so you understand what you're watching because our game is a little weird. Um, so Lobato's level is, um, starts in a mundane office building. And the mission starts with Raz, Lily, Sasha, Mia, and Coach on a mission to figure out who Dr. Lobato is, or Dr. Lobato's boss is. So they've created this construct of a mundane office in order to trick Dr. Lobato into signing a vacation form for winning an Employee of the Year award. But Dr. Lobato quickly realizes that there is a trick going on in his mind and begins to set traps. And so this mundane office building turns into a disgusting dental hell that you have to try to escape. No spoilers there. Um, so we quickly got to brainstorming with our new process. And one of the things that I would like to do with my teams when we're first starting on levels is coming up some brainstorms and doing some target art. And the target art are just pieces that kind of say, this is the weird experience we can have, but it's not tied to anything we're actually gonna be doing. This is just a vision setting piece. So a really talented artist, Gian, uh, Gigi, I'll just use her real nickname, um, created these really talented, fully formed visions of what some of the weird things and spaces we could do with this op weird concept of office building and dental hell. So these images really kind of told us we were on a right journey and a path of what we could do with some of these spaces. Um, and we were able to verify that really quickly with some brainstorms and exercises. In addition to working out uh, the general theme of the level, we started to dig into what you're actually doing. So we knew that the Lobato level and the E3 2019 demo were also going to be our tutorial level. And at this point, because we had two years of development under, under our belt, most of our powers were somewhat figured out but not refined. So we knew what you were gonna be doing at the beginning of the game and what power set Raz was going to have. So we needed to think about ways to use those powers in unique ways and to create some danger rooms for power learning and tutorials. So because of the weird <laughs> concepts in our game, um, we had to really think about how we can identify what is TKable, what is powerable, what can you use your powers on because every single level looks different and what is a, a, a proper hazard is gonna be a completely different object in the next brain. So we use these concepts to illustrate how we can use T Raz's powers within spatial concepts. So you see some of these really great ideas that came through the final game, particularly you know, the TK puzzle, which I'll get in into a little bit later. And then the side blast room, that long walk uh, up the uh, executive table came directly from this really quick you know, thumbnail. And so you're starting to see how the integration of design and art really started to shape the gameplay spaces that we were creating. Another great way we helped support design was to do quick mock-ups of what puzzle spaces could look like. I think one of the most challenging things about spatial design in puzzle, with puzzles is figuring out what the solution is and, and not just that, figuring out the various things a player may not or do wrong in order to find that solution. So we use a lot of really quick sketches in order to visual problem solve that didn't require us to constantly change our environment art to react to those changes. This, giant tooth and this is an example of 
us helping problem solve the final result of Coach's TK puzzle. Finally! Great job following orders, Private. You go on ahead. I'll take up the rear guard. So what we ended up having with these new processes and, and this new um, way to work was a really strong final result. Lobata was our first level that we rebooted and the E3 demo just had an amazing result. We got a lot of awards and a lot of press. And so we knew that what we were doing was right and we had to could now go back and redo a good chunk of the game. But all of this work was worth it. Um, th there were some downsides. Uh, the art was a bit more bespoke, cost a little bit more time. Um, but it paid off in overall improvements and uh, team morale finally started to increase. So now let's fast forward to one of the last levels we worked on, which was Bob's Bottles. Um, I think it's one of the last ones we worked on because it was the hardest subject matter we had to cover. And the subject matter was alcohol addiction. Um, our main subject, Bob Zanotto, we find him in a very sad state. And we had to explain why. And this is not the type of thing you want to actually experience sometimes when you're playing a game. It's usually escapism. But this story was so central to what happened to the Psychonauts in this game that we had to explore it. It also was central to why Bob's mental words were so sad. So there was really no way around it. So a quick synopsis of what happens in Bob's Bottles. Um, you essentially uh, start um, finding Bob inside of a greenhouse. And he's essentially drinking himself um, and feeding his plants. And when he answers, he doesn't want you there, but the plants quickly realize that you're there to help him and they help you enter his brain. And once you're inside of his mind, you find him on a tiny island, um, kind of isolated and by himself. And he knows that there's these memories out in the world that he needs to collect that he's cast off in order to help himself. So you and Bob go on a mission in order to find these memory seeds and to help heal Bob's pain. So our first bottle we had to tackle was Tia's bottle. And Tia is Bob's mom. And so we needed a way to tell Bob's story about his mother because it's sort of the origin story of where his addiction came from. So our first explorations were really focused on the theme of alcohol. So there's a lot of bottles and tropical drinks and you know champagne fountains. Um, and some of this stuff actually worked and landed, and then some of it felt a little, I don't know, too celebratory. So we really started to explore what this world could look like, but trying to figure out our way. So this is an example of one of our first prototypes. Um, this is an environment level by Jeremy French. She's one of our talented environment artists. And you're also seeing the, the first expressions of what Bob's bottles looks like. You see the water bubble, which is one of the main mechanics that we use to kind of move Raz and keep him dry in this very alcohol-soaked space. You're also seeing these floating bottles, like the alcohol elements are really obvious. You know, the primitives are alcohol-themed. The uh, platforms are floating orange slices. So you get that there's, there's a there there, but it just isn't really reflecting what is happening to Bob. Um, in addition, it just felt like the kit process here, again, was just not working. Um, and then on top of that, uh, it just didn't feel like we were being reverent to what was happening to Bob. This is a serious topic. And it just felt like uh, we were kind of brushing over it. Um, so before I get into that, um, so we struggled with Bob for a little bit. And then I had kind of an epiphany moment while I was out dancing. It's a thing that I do to kind of disconnect and, and reconnect to my soul. And the lyrics to the song hit me. And that was when I kind of knew what we needed to do. So I'll let the lyrics play. And we won't listen to the whole song. <laughs> This is the explicit version. Hold up. Frank, Frank. Headshot. Frank, Frank. Sit down. Frank, Frank. Stand up. Frank, Frank. Pass out. Frank, Frank. Wake up. Frank, Frank. Fade it. Frank, Frank. Fade it. 
Right. Now I done grew around some people living their life in bottles Granddaddy had the golden flags, backstroke every day in Chicago Some people like the way it feels, some people want to kill their sorrow Some people want to fit in with the popular, that was my problem I was in the dark room, loud tombs, looking to make a vow Soon that I'ma get fucked up, filling up my cup, I see the crowd Mood changing by the minute, and the record on repeat Took a sip, then another sip, then somebody said to me Nigga. So the thing about this song that really struck me was that it sounds like a club banger. You think you're having a good time in your party, but when you really listen to the lyrics, it's a person's story of alcoholism and drinking to fit in. And that was actually what was happening to Bob, and that was what we were trying to do. We were trying to create this fun experience, but tell a sad story. So I started really thinking how we were using the themes of alcoholism in the level. And so we started really exploring how we can use environmental storytelling to say and experience what happened to Bob and his memories. And also to find a way to move the player through 3D space. So in one of our initial brainstorms for Bob's Bottles, we came up with this really great idea since we knew you had to visit his mother. And similar to Bob, he would spend his time, she would spend her time in the greenhouse drinking. So we needed some way for you to kind of have these moments of interacting with her, even though she's not necessarily present in your memories. Um, and also how we can tell the story of how her condition deteriorated. So we came up with the idea of this recursive kitchen. Um, there we had this really great relative gravity mechanic. And so we wanted to use that mechanic in this space and also find some way to tell Bob's story without necessarily having to see her suffer. So when you're in the kitchen, you start to see, as you progress through the level, you start to begin to see this vegetation take over the kitchen. And the vegetation represents the greenhouse where she would drink and also where Bob drinks. So it's sort of a really uh, subtle way of saying that her mental state is starting to deteriorate. We also wanted to show ways of what happened to her without necessarily having to show you know, something violent and unsettling, because this is really about Bob's memories of his mom, not the tragic exactly what happened moment. Um, so we wanted something very tasteful and a way to, to sort of what happened to her as a result of her addiction. So this is a quick, really first pass playthrough one of our kitchens. This is kitchen number two, and the first one is pristine, but this one really shows you the various details that we were just starting to play around with. As you progress through the kitchens, the dishes pile up higher, the greenhouse takes over, the space becomes a little bit more relative gravity. So what we're really trying to do, in addition to telling Bob's story through audio cues, you know, he's running through the kitchen, calling out for his mother and noticing things about something being wrong, um, that we were able to kind of tell this really sad story in a subtle way without necessarily having to point to all of the alcohol bottles and the obvious problems. And this is the final the result. Greenhouse for so long. This is when Greenhouse has taken over. This is our environment artist, Nick Maxim, doing some voiceover. So you can see the greenhouse is fully taken over. Um, toward the end, you see these red bottles kind of pointing to her fate. And then you find her, uh, you find out her fate once you enter the drain and, and find her memory seed. So, we were able to find a way to tell that story, but we had another challenging story to tell, and this one was the Helmet Bottle. And Helmet is a character who is also one of the Psychonauts, who is sort of a central figure in this story for Psychonauts too. Um, Helmet uh, passed away in the battle against Miligula, and that fissure really broke the Psychonauts. Um, so Helmet was a very important story, and he was also Bob's love of his life and so his loss of Helmet was a pivotal moment and why he is the way he is. So when we started working on um, Bob's Bottles, the design team had a really strong idea, which was that there was going to be this landmark in the distance that you had to ascend to. And we liked that idea because so much of Psychonauts ended up being very flat um, or you were kind of going down and around, but there wasn't a lot of going up. So we liked the idea of ascending, but we didn't know what we were actually ascending to. We know that most of the levels start in a swamp and then they change, but we weren't quite sure where we were going. But because we knew this was about Helmet and it was the love of his life, we quickly 
settled on the idea of the level being a wedding cake, a collapsed wedding cake. So I came up with some concepts and uh, mood boards of what a collapsed wedding cake could look like in addition to some feedback from our artists to see if how this surfacing could work for the level, how we could theme the cake so it isn't all you know sweet cotton candy and cherries. I mean, this is a really sad story. Um, and we needed to figure out what was going to be at the top of this cake. You know, we weren't quite sure what was going to be there at that time. We just knew you wanted to get to something. And there were various ideas like a sword or a Viking helmet because that's what hel you know, helmet wore. But mm, it didn't really feel relevant to what Bob was missing and desiring. So I really looked at who Helmet was and what he looked like. And in the game, he's this really bright and colorful character in his level. Um, but it didn't feel like that's how Bob would remember him. That's his, Bob is his long lost lover. Um, and um, because, you know, Helmet always wore this Viking hat, I imagine he had this very idealized vision of what Helmet looked like. And so I digged through some old concepts that Scott Campbell did, and I found these really great, this really great sketch over here to the left of, you know, a shirtless Viking Bob. And, and I thought that that would be the I ideal version of Bob to create at the top of this cake. And this is, you know, your final result. We have this really great cake. Um, and then you ascend as you realize that this is the moment that Bob, you know, always wanted. He wanted to ask him to marry him. Until you reach the top, and then things get very sad. So we knew where we were going. We finally figured out what the topper was. We knew we were making a cake, but how are you going to get to the top? So we started doing sketches on what the various tiers of the cake could look like. And we started theming those around what you do at a wedding. So uh, we were thinking of like, you know, there's a candy table, there's, uh, you know, the dollar dance and the, you know, bride and the, you know, groom's dance, but mm, we weren't quite sure what we were gonna do with the space. And then we talked with our combat designer, Lauren Scott, and I quickly realized we needed a place for a fight. And I couldn't think of a better place for a fight at a wedding than the reception. So this is the reception area that we created. Um, and you can see the, the continued ascent up to the, the Bob Topper. But we were able to create a fun space where you could throw chairs and, and knock over dishes and beat up the DJ. So it was a really fun uh, way to express a wedding. In addition to creating and understanding spaces, there are a lot of mechanical things we had to figure out. Um, one, we had wall jumps, and we are trying to figure out how do you wall jump against a cake. So this is a really quick concept we did on how you could possibly use cake as a wall jump um, object. And we also had to figure out how you were going to get to from the bottom of the cake, which is the swap, to the next tier, which takes you from the swing to the reception area. And one of the challenges we had was we didn't want to make this a large level. This is one of the last levels we had to make. We still had bosses to finish. Like, we can't spend six months on this. So we needed to figure out some quick way to get you to the top of the cake. So one of the great things about our new process was that one of the ways we kind of worked out ideation quickly was that we would do quick prototypes with design. So they would do quick prototypes on mechanics and we would try to figure out what art would do to support that. And sometimes those prototypes ended up in the game, a lot of them did not. Um, one of the prototypes that I really enjoyed um, was in the it was supposed to be a large tree inside of the QA. And early on, those, the inside of that tree got cut. And so the prototype for that got cut as well. So it was just kind of laying around for years and not being used. And our lead designer, Seth Marinello, undug it, and he came up with an innovative way to get us to the top of the cake. All right, this is the before. So we... He created a mechanical space where there's essentially a Euclidean design. You can get, you know, this memory seed prompts you to enter, but essentially it's a, an unending recurring tunnel. And it was a very interesting way to, one, get you through the layers of the cake, and to get you to transport you anywhere that we needed you to go. So it turned out to be a really great way to uh, visualize the inside of our cake. 
And this is the final look. So you're seeing the cake layers. Um, I would use the icing hey, as a marker to make so sure you close. knew what direction you were going. Wait, no, I want that. And of course, the memory seat is still driving you through. There's some string lights to kind of drive you forward. Wait a minute. And you also notice that the cake layers I don't know are changing. About this place. So the cake layers really help to sort of orient the player. So if you know if you're going too far forward or too far back, <laughs> because the cake layers would change. So it was a really great shader that our VFX team made in order to really sell it that you were inside of this large collapsing crumpled cake. And so this really great results um, came together for Bob, even though it was one of our hardest levels to tell the story of. Um, and I think it's also one of our best levels. Um, we have wilder and wackier things, but from a vision and look standpoint, we have some of the like widest range of looks. Uh, one of my favorite is, I love the look of the kitchen. Um, and it, it just really tells the story of what's happening to her really well. And I also just love the underground, underwater areas. Like I would just sit in those spaces um, <laughs> with the engine, game engine on and just enjoy being there. So I think Bob's Bottles really came together. We found a way to tell a story about Helmet that was very human and um, focused on the challenges of addiction, but not necessarily disrespectful to the topics. And turned out to be, I think, one of our stronger levels thematically. So now that we've gotten through all the brains that we needed to do, the last hurdle we had to get through was boss fights. And boss fights were on the chopping block for getting cut for quite some time because we were just constantly trying to deal with funding and time because that's what happens when you make games. So <laughs> Boss Art Jams were a quick way that we put our ideas together in order to execute on five bosses in maybe six to eight months, which is insane. Usually one boss takes five months. Um, but we needed to form multiple strike teams so we can hit our ship date. So one of the ways that I did that was uh, doing an art jam session with the artists. So Art Jams is something that Double Fine had done previously. Um, it's just sort of a casual way for them to hang out. They would meet, we would meet at lunch. You would come up with a theme, and the artist would just draw something for fun. It was just a regular thing they did. Occasionally, they would do that when they're kicking off a game. But it wasn't just something we did constantly. So people were having so much fun in that meeting. And you know, at this point, everyone was kind of burnt out after two years of levels, um, and the bosses were kind of the last hurl. So I wanted to come up with a fun way for the team to interact with one another again. So we leveraged all the talent and focus of the artists in the studio on a big game jam, or um, not game jam, but boss jam session that we call the boss blitz. And we would tackle one boss at a time. And so that format really helped us sort of come up with these really strong ideas for what our boss encounters could look like. One of the best and the first art jams we did was for Hollis's level, Hollis's hot streak. Um, so there were some things we knew about the boss, but we just had a really hard time nailing what she looked like throughout the development. So we knew that she had to be an octopus um, because the hotel you go to in the first mission is octopus shaped. Um, and we also established that for Hollis, her addiction takes the form of an octopus. Um, so we knew that that language needed to be there, but what the octopus did and what attacks she had kept changing over time. And what you're seeing here is this you know, random collection of all the weird things we thought we could do with the boss. And a lot of this fluctuation happened because we were constantly changing the power. It was probably one of the last powers we nailed the mechanics on. So it just sort of led to some challenging results for our designs. Um, You've seen the Luctibus Hotel here on the left. One of the you know, fun, weird designs we had or very early on based on the mental connection mechanic at that time was that she would be a com computerized beast. Um, and that was because at the time, mental connection operated like mental taffy, but you could also use it to string electrical charges together. It just, it was a, it was a unique experience of using mental connection, but it was confusing because you could do something positive with the same power and then have it be punitive. So it just didn't really land. So we abandoned that and then we started, you know, let the power kind of settle and as the story changed, so did Lucky's look. So these are all the various ways we tried to express Lucky, but they just weren't really hitting. 
But now with the power settled, we felt it was a good time to revisit it. So we kicked off a new jam. And I'll just give you some quick updates of what you should do to prepare for an art jam. And these are really effective sessions, um, especially if you can bring people from your team or who are not on your team to them to help kind of shake the team up in some of their ideas. So the first thing you do with our jam, um, you do need a little bit of preparation, and that is to uh, remind people of the mission that they're on. And you give them information about where they're going. Here's an example of uh, one of the decks we use to get people prepared to enter Hollis's mind and what they're going to experience. Um, there's also information about where you're going to have this battle. Um, this is a concept from Peter Chan. Um, he very early on, he did this concept, and we liked the idea of this kind of room that was made of playing cards um, that would kind of fall apart um, if, if you had a fight or a battle or, or would react to what's happening. So we kind of knew what space we wanted, but not exactly how we were going to use it. Um, we also wanted to update people on who else is in the fight. Um, the interns um, are in this fight. And so we wanted people to think of ways to find the interns and use them in their fight and outside of the battle. Um, with, uh, with our boss and with Raz. And if, last but not, fine, um, not last but not least, you also want to remind them of the mechanics. Um, a lot of the boss's behaviors and look are going to be changed by their attacks. So we wanted to also let the player know, like, these are the, this is the main power we want you to use. You can use others. But we want your attacks to focus on this one. So these are the results for some of those jams. And if you look closely, you can see how some of these ideas ended up in the final game. Um, this is a quick concept sketches done by Nathan Bagel, Stapley. And these are quick ideations on what the form of the octopus could take, but most importantly, how she could work within play space. And I thought this was a really great little sketch over here on the bottom right, because that became a very clear way to help us solve a different problem we were having with the octopus. One of the biggest challenges we also had with Lucktopus was her scale. Um, we know we wanted her to be gigantic. She has this big uh, symbolism of addiction, so or gambling addiction. So we know she had to have a large scale, and she was a boss, so she needed to be foreboding. But the challenge is that Lucky had eight limbs. She's an octopus. And that is a nightmare for an animator to have to animate a, a, a character or a creature with eight unique tentacles. So our team got together and really started thinking about how can we use Lucky's form in a unique way and also create some cool and unique attacks. So once we started brainstorming about what we could do with the tentacles, a very fun idea started to emerge. So we knew that we wanted the room that you started the boss battle in to break apart, um, but we didn't know quite how. And we also knew we didn't want to animate eight unique tentacles. So we needed to come up with a unique way for the boss to present himself and attack. And so Chris Clam did these really great concepts of how the Lucky could work in the space and what Raz could do. Um, and you start to see that the tentacles are taking the form of a room on the left. And then on the right, now we're seeing some ideas of the, the tentacles are actually just independent elements as well. And sort of take on the form of the room that is breaking apart. And thankfully, having the artist and the animators involved, particularly the animator, helped us brainstorm attacks that worked for animation and didn't create too much of a scope creep. So what you're seeing here is the final example of some of the sketches that actually ended up in the game, particularly the card pass over there in the upper left and the defibrillator on the upper right. Um, both of those attacks are in the final game, and that came from these really quick art jams. It, it just sort of invigorated the team, and, and we quickly threw prototypes together based on these sketches. So now that we knew what Lucky needed to do and what attacks she was going to have, the final thing was to finally go back and finish her design. Um, so we went back to Scott Campbell, and we wanted to revisit one of the first ideas for Lucky. And we really liked the idea of her being made of a neon sign. That was like one of the first things we thought and Levi sketched out. And so we wanted to revisit that, but, but in a new form. Um, design also thought it would be a really great idea to use her body as a way to give feedback. So her light states changed based on if she's taking damage or attacks or if she's upset. 
And then you see the design for, you know, the push design of the tentacles and what they could work and look like. Um, my favorite little detail is the little cuff link cuff at the end, you know, because she's a little poker player. So those little details all finally came together and we knew who our boss was going to be. In addition to finalizing the look of the design, we started doing prototypes. And this is a quick example of a prototype that Chris Clam did to prove that we could get the technical to work as an attack element. Um, and that was sort of like the, the final um, confirmation we needed that we just needed to move forward in and finalize this boss fight. I made some bad connections in your mind. And this and is the final sort of moment, the reveal moment that's in the action. And now you calling a bad idea? I am the sweetest of dreams, the spirit of unbeatable optimism. I am the ultimate victory of hope over mathematics. I am the Lady Lucktopus, but you can call me Lucky. So Lucky really came together well through this process. So our gems are really great tool you can use with your team. It gives the artist something fun to do, especially if they're not on your team and they just want to get away from their projects so they can solve somebody else's problems. It's also a really great way to give the team themselves just a wealth of ideas to pull from if they get stuck. Um, and it just turned out to be a fun process that I'm definitely going to be using moving forward. So that is the uh, end of the talk. I'd like to share with you this real um, of all of the beautiful places that we've made in Psychonauts. Um, and then it's just been an honor and an achievement to work on a game of this scale and quality with such a small team. There are only 73 people on this, in the studio at Double Fine. Um, large studios have three or 400 people. So it's just really an achievement that we were able to create such a fun and unique experience. With just such a varied and just breadth of beautiful style. I mean, this was a unique project to work on. Um, to have 13 brain levels that all need to be art directed differently was an insane challenge. But I think that it paid off to just a beautiful player experience that you're seeing here. So I just want to say a great thank you to the team at Double Fine. And we can move on to Q&A. Any questions? Um, quick uh, note, um, just like the game, uh, there is a mental health advisory, so we are discussing sensitive topics. So um, please handle them with care and um, empathy. Hi. Hi. Um, so this is more of a comment for admiration. So I just want to thank you very much for being in this space. Um, you actually gave me so much agency to be in this career and grow in this career. So thank you so, so much. Um, I don't have any questions for you. Just, just a big, big thank you for appreciation. Thank you. Um, so I want to start out by saying that you did such an excellent job of making Lobato's level really gross. Like, um, <laughs> I hate teeth. I, do, I can't do teeth, but I wanted to play this game so bad that I literally, some parts of Lobato's level, I literally had to close my eyes and like, <laughs> So yeah, that's, it, it was awful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but my question, <laughs> my question was, um, the figments are such a, a big part of Psychonauts, and um, especially even more so than the first game, these figments are so unique to each level and do are, and are such a part of that storytelling um, that really helps tell the story of what's going on there. But also, 
um, the fundraising campaign, I know one level of rewards was backers were able to design their own figments and put those in the game. And that was a reward. So I really wanted to know how you compromise the figments as a storytelling element that were unique and important to the level with the backers' ideas and their that system. Yeah, we had, um, well, the figments have always been a really special thing, as you mentioned, to the game. Um, and it was extremely important to Tim um, that we make them as unique and built into the space as possible. So for the backers, what we ended up doing was getting requests from them on what they wanted their uh, figment to be. And we tried to find spaces that made sense visually for them. I mean, some of them were like cat butt, so I don't know where you're gonna do with the cat butt. But <laughs> the rest of them maybe were a little bit more physical, so we tried to find thematic places where they worked. Just as a follow-up, were there any that you were absolutely just couldn't find a place for? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, our, our worlds are so wacky and varied that <laughs> we found a place for everything. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hello, so, hi, Elisa. Uh, I'm Yusan. I work at EA, and I had a pleasure of working with you many, many years ago, and I'm still there. After you left EA, you had really colorful career, and uh, the last two places are this one as an art director, and the one before was an uh, um, art manager at Ubisoft. Um, how would you describe the differences between art manager and art director, and what made you come back to art direction? Yes, um, I think that depends from studio to studio, but if I was gonna give you like a high level difference, um, art management focuses on the scheduling and the staff, where art direction is more focused on the visual design and, and what you're making. But at a studio, like Double Fine, it's really two jobs. So I was doing a little bit of both. Um, at a studio like um, Ubisoft, I was also doing a little bit of both. So it's one of those like, two for jobs, if you're gonna be honest, um, or you do end up doing a little bit of both. But some studios have just dedicated art directors and that's all of it do. Um, so ideally, if you're working at a big project or a big studio, the two jobs are separated where the art manager works with the art director. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, Double Fine has people who's been there forever. So I know that a lot of people are very close to each other, they know each other. How was it to come to that kind of environment when um, you were coming from outside? Well, I think you do what you should do when you're in a space that is not yours and that is you learn and you listen and you get to know people. And so that's the first thing I did. I didn't come in trying to control. I just kind of came in to understand what was happening and how I could help. And I think that that was why I had a warm reception at Double Fine. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. Hi, um, I was just quickly asking um, if there was any problems you had in making this game feel like a continuation of the last. Uh, yes, at times. I think at the beginning of the project, we were struggling to find our way. I think the concepts were really wild, but they didn't feel like they had a context to the characters. Uh, for example, like there was an idea of making a macaroni level at the beginning. Um, where you know you're just kind of going through a, a block of mac and cheese, but we didn't know where that would fit with the story. Um, Bob's bottles, for example, was actually like a inside of a bonsai topiary at first, because he was in his greenhouse. But there was just a lot of challenges with the space. So for us, it really has to be the marriage of story and environment that I think where we know we're kind of hitting something that was going to work. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. Hi, you talked a lot about trying to keep the tone of the game with the themes that you're going for and trying to balance that in a sensitive way. How did you find coming to that? Was there a sort of core value that you kept trying to stick to? Or was it a sort of, as, it, as the problem sort of came up, like you said, with the bottles mm -hmm. um, level? So I think there are like some tenets that we all kind of followed, pillars for design. Um, I think one of the things we kind of always look for was whether something was psychonautical. We, we talked about that a little earlier. For me, artistically, I was always looking for what I consider the signatures of psychonaut style. The first thing is wonk, where nothing is exactly the same size, things are always askewed, nothing is you know, perfect angles. And that's a you know, style that came from the first game. 
And we needed to make sure that that was present in this game. Because it's kind of central to why the environments and levels feel very dreamlike. It's just, everything is kind of off kilter. So things didn't kind of have that off kilter, psychedelic kind of feel to them. We immediately knew they were a little bit off. In addition to that, um, Tim's a great storyteller. So if we had a strong story, we kind of had more meat to work with rather than some of the concepts that were a little bit more challenging. And third, I think we had some really great concepts artists on the team that helped us find that vision quickly. Um, one of the key members of the first game was Peter Chan. And Peter Chan did a lot of the environment on Psychonauts 1. And while he wasn't a full time or even barely a member on the team, he did come in at times in the beginning to help us do these really high level art pieces. Um, if you've ever seen Peter Chan's art, it's insane. And he only works in pencil. I've never seen anybody like him. Um, so he'll take these really odd things that Tim would give him and he would just come up with these like pencil drawing sketches. And so those really early high, high level, just conceptual drawings, I think really told us whether we were hitting something or not. And when they felt cool, we just kind of kept pursuing. So that yes and thing we were talking about earlier. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, I have a, another question about figments, uh, more so about the process and how they ended up where they end up in the game. A lot of it uh, feels that an artist was in there drawing that directly into, um, into that spot in the scene. However, uh, there seems to be a lot of placement where it feels like a designer is, you know, this is a breadcrumb approach or this is a uh, find the missing thing. Uh, a, for example, one figment was a missing uh, slot machine in this spot, so they remove it from the environment. So I guess my question is, what is that process like? Is it going back and forth between design? Or do we just have sometimes an artist just goes in, delete a slot machine and put a figment there? I'm very curious how that works. I think it's a bit more collaborative, as you mentioned. Um, we would come up with some really rough designs of what figments could look like in a space, but it wasn't until we were in them that we knew what was going to work. Um, for example, we have some large doorways where there are figments inside of them, um, and we kind of use that as a way for you to uh, know where to go forward, as you mentioned, the breadcrumbing. So they're also used for visual storytelling and then a mix of, of kind of moving the player through or letting them know that there's something over here, please go there. Um, so you are correct, it was a little bit of both. Okay, um, if I may press uh, mm -hmm. a push more on the question, did you have a formalized process as you were going through it or was it more of a, as you were reviewing it, pointing at a spot and saying, let's talk about figments here? Um, I think it was a bit more of a, a pass that we would do toward mm -hmm. at the end of the level, like once everything was signed up in place. Um, there were some figments that were present just because we knew we needed them to be there for design needs. And then we would do a final pass so to make sure if there's anything with storytelling that we would go through. So it was, it's a multi-phase process. It was what it was necessary for design and then a, a second pass and what was necessary for aesthetics. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of related to the previous question, I'm really curious about uh, how in, how your concept artists collaborated with your uh, level designers to create something as fun and unique as this with as many iterations as it went through. Were there any specific points of friction that you found were kind of solved by a specific process? Um, I would say that process was probably the thing I leaned into the most. Um, especially with the concept team and the level teams. So we always tried to make sure that the concept team was embedded with each level team so that they were developing concepts in time with those you know, same partners. So we don't, may not necessarily do a concept of a white butt space immediately, but we will react to that. And then conversely, somebody will say, I don't know what I'm doing here. Can you do a drawing? And so we would do a drawing and try to come up with some concepts of what could happen in the space. So it was really symbiotic. Um, it wasn't like a, a very solid process, more of a art created in reaction to necessity. Okay, uh, if, may I ask a follow-up? Um, how long did it take to kind of fall into a good cadence? Um, I would say once I started, it took a few months, maybe almost a year to figure out what we needed to do for the reboot. And because we were under time pressure, we had to just kind of get E3 done. So once we knew we, were, we had a good way to work, um, and we finished the Lobato level, I would say that team had a really strong understanding of how to move forward, and then the rest of the team had to fold in. And I think that transition probably took a little bit longer to go from one strike team to five strike teams, Thank you. or four strike teams. 
Five minutes? Okay. One more question. Uh, I know that you guys at Double Fine interact with the um, kind of with education on an individual level. Does Double Fine as a studio provide anything for educators? Oh, um, so. educate people who are educators outside of yeah, like at the so. collegiate level. Like you know, do you guys have like here's here's stuff that you can use? Like here's some of our anything like that, or is that more individual based on you guys? I think it's more individual. I don't think I've heard of a. a, a a formal initiative to support educators. But I do think that there's something that we would be interested in. Um, we do have all of our work archived, so sharing that may actually be beneficial. So you may want to reach out to uh, PR, which is our person um, called James Bafford, to see. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I think that's the end of questions. Once again, thank you for coming to the Psychonauts 2 talk. Um, if you'd like to follow me or keep in contact, you can use my QR code here and add me on LinkedIn. Um, thanks for coming. It was really great to see friends new and old and have all of you guys brave COVID uh, to come out and experience the Game Developers Conference. So thank you for coming, everybody.